Hey guys, I'm Nathan. This is Craig from Arms and Armor. We decided that with all of the discussions in the sword community about what historical swords were like, this called for a whiskey and weapons. Cheers. Today we got some wild turkey because we're not that classy. And we're old. <laughs> That's some rye. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, if you're on the, the social medias, in the past month, there have been a bunch of kind of discussions about what medieval swords were actually like and how modern uh, replicas differ from them. And this is something we've been interested in for a long time. So Craig, you've been here since the beginning of Arms and Armor. Why don't yeah. you talk about like how, what our approach is to uh, well, we, yeah, we've always been most attracted to those pieces behind the glass at museums or that collectors have had that have shared them with us. When you get a original sword in your hand, it's got certain qualities, certain uh, ways of, of being uh, fitting to your hand. The aesthetics of it are of a certain quality that you get from a handmade object. Um, it's not chunked out in a factory. It's not just plopped out. Um, if they're making a pile of them, they are doing that individually by part so that it's gonna have nuances. There's gonna be bits and pieces that fit a little differently on each one. And that's always been a huge appeal to us mm -hmm. about these pieces and how they come together. Uh, our approach to that has always been to try and uh, replicate those things as close as we could. Uh, way back when we first started, you know, we were we were kind of trying to figure that out the best we could. Over the years, we've evolved into using uh, our skills to craft a piece, or if we're lucky enough, get a mold of a piece and try and replicate that. Uh, when we do craft it, we're trying to craft it as they would have, so we don't necessarily create a piece that you can take a uh, calipers too and it's going to be exact as if it came off machine tools. What we're striving to do is create a piece that's a wheel pommel or a cross guard that's got the look and feel of an original with the detailing of the original but it fits and functions as the originals do. Um, and that is a different aesthetic than what you would want on your car. Oh for sure. Yeah, you, you want all your car doors to open the same way you want the gaps between your car doors to be relatively the same side to side. You want your, re your wheels to be legit round. Yeah, yeah. And we've talked about some of this before in our other things, oh. but you know, a medieval cross guard isn't necessarily the same width on each side of the blade. So uh, while we don't strive to make them imperfect, uh, if the original we're copying is imperfect, then we have to make that decision. Or if we're making it by hand, you hold it up and it looks good, it looks right, that's what we're after. Not that you can put a laser pointer on it and tell that it's this bit off or that bit off. Right, um, that's one of the cool things about medieval pieces were by and large built by the eye. Yeah. Right, they're built to, to the eye. How's it looking? Exactly. Yeah. And that leads to a certain look and a certain feel that you know, we love. And so when we reproduce something, you know, there's two main ways that we do it. One is we make a mold from the original piece. And if we can't do that, then we hand carve and make a replica of it yeah. to make a mold of. As, as they would have, you yeah. know. So yeah. uh, like as this piece is an example, Here's a part we've molded off the sword uh, so we can make this piece over and over again if it was good enough to put on a sword and sell it. This piece, which is just a molded right off an original, really looks great. It's got some great details on it, very early little side ring on it, all these kind of cool things. But if I put this on a sword and just sold it the way it is, we, we'd get hammered. Uh, People would be complaining about it left, right, and center. Not only has it got some rough bits and some 
uh, very asymmetrical detailing on it from the original maker, but at different points, this somebody has put this original in a vise. So you got some yeah. vice teeth marks showing here and things like that. So while we can take this and then start to use this as a base to start crafting our piece that we'll mold, it's um, one of those things where just because it's from an original doesn't mean you can sell it exactly. today. <laughs> exactly. And so here, I'll show you guys this sword and this casting. Right, so here's this original sword from the Oak, the Oakshot Institute collection. It's one that Ewart collected. Here is a really rough um, casting that we made from this cross guard that, you know, we were like, hey, how will this look? Not good enough. <laughs> right, we're gonna have to do a bunch of work to put this sword into production, which we want to do because it is beautiful, super sweet. And this is part of that development uh, process and you know it part of it comes down to just aesthetics right what kind of things do you value about these swords and you know aesthetics part of it's personal and that's cool some people want something that is utterly perfect and modern I got no problem with that if that's what you want we're probably not the person for you Right, because well, we yeah. really want, I mean, we can, <laughs> like, we're capable of it, yeah. but it's not really exactly what we do. Uh, some people really want it to look just like a 500 year old antique, which we can do, but we want to know why you want it to want yeah. it look exactly like a 500 year old antique. And so to be honest, on eBay. yeah, to be <laughs> honest, when we do do those kind of things, we make sure there's certain little bits in there that any re expert's gonna know, um, yeah. that we can see those. This morning, great example. Mm -hmm. Searching for something completely different on the internet this morning to uh, do a blog post and for a picture, and popped up was an old flange mace of ours we've probably made 15, 20 years ago at this point, mm -hmm. and it was being sold in England in an auction as a Victorian replica. And, you know? yeah. <laughs> and it's like, you know, anybody that looked at it was like, you know, would know that's probably not the case because the parts that were welded were still kind of shiny and new and the other parts were all rusty because it had rusted differently, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so that community or that, that taste, you know, the community has a taste, the, the sword buying community, you personally have your taste. Mm -hmm. And if you're studying and researching and uh, interested in swords, your taste will evolve over time. Uh, I think it's something else we've mentioned in the past, but you know, many of the people that I've made multiple swords for, they will have a, a, a series of sword types that they will go through. Mm -hmm. And the pieces that we make for them most recently will be much different than the ones they first started with. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you first start, a lot of people are very into that knightly, single-handed sword. Nothing wrong with that. Some of the coolest swords ever made were like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but over time, you see people's uh, taste choices change. They do research, they find out different aspects. You find out about sword types you never knew existed. Sure. Um, but that's where doing solid research in good sources is the main thing. Oh yeah. yeah, and this has been, you know, it's been a big part of these discussions. Like, how do you know mm -hmm. what you know about swords? Is it because you listened to people on the internet? Oh, or yeah. is it because you read, you know, your books, right? Or you read someone else's books, yeah. right? This is all a process of learning things, but in any of those situations, you have to be aware of the limitations of of the oh, yeah. knowledge you're coming across. Yep. Like, God, there's one time where I was foolishly engaging with a Reddit discussion. Never do that. And uh, I had made a blog post about long swords and bastard swords and hand and a half swords. Now, they're the same thing, right? And some dude, I don't know, they were probably 13 or something, was like, dude, you idiot. I can show you two videos by these two internet personalities that show you that you're wrong. Alright, 
this is not the place for that fight. Right, yeah, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, quality of source is an, very important, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, don't assume that you're getting in the snippets that we put up yeah. and the, the tidbits of historical information. We try to always have good quality information. Mm -hmm. We've been doing this. 40, 45 years. I have read many, many books on swords. I have knowledge about swords that can make people's eyes glaze over in a party within <laughs> moments, okay? Um, you wanna see my wife run away, walk up to a group of us having a discussion and ask a question on swords. Uh, you know, Just that, smart <laughs> But with that comes, you know, an understanding of things that it's a completely different level than somebody that's doing a couple hours research, probably on the internet, to make another video for the internet. Yeah. Um, th those sources won't give you the quality. Or the depth, depth of knowledge. Yeah, right? the depth. Yeah. The depth of knowledge. And so, I don't know, like, we're both educators. Craig was a high school teacher, mm -hmm. I was a college professor, and doing research is super important and we'll talk some more about this in some future blog posts but you got to read books <laughs> and reading a book is a good starting point but even if the person is an acknowledged expert what they're writing is their expert opinion mm -hmm. right which doesn't mean that it's you know god's own work and you have all kinds of situations where evidence changes, interpretations change over time. You have three different experts who all disagree about something. Mm -hmm. What you mm -hmm. want to do to learn about swords is to learn about all of their perspectives and why they think what they think. And that's one of the things that's hard on the internet. People just kind of say stuff like it's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, so the, I want to show you something cool here. Is this, we were just digging through some books, and so this one's pretty fun, interesting book, and we just opened it up, and it's got uh, handwritten notes in it that Ewart uh, Oakshot made while he was studying this book, right? So he's taking notes and, you know, drawing pommels, and stuff as he's formulating his expert opinions. And that's part of the process of figuring stuff out. We're kind of excited when we pull this out. Yeah, and he, he was an illustrator as, as, as a, per, that's what he did for his job. Mm -hmm. And an art historian in, a, in the context of learning how to be an illustrator. Um, so when he saw something in a painting or in a sculpture, he could bring the knowledge of that example into the context of the, the group of surviving examples we were basing the opinions on. Mm -hmm. um, with Ewart, you know, that's now a generation, maybe two yeah. in the past. So there's some things going on right now that uh, where we've found more examples of these things. They have uh, some of the archaeological finds that have you know, occurred over the last 10 years are, are good. <laughs> Some maybe not. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, those are all things that go into the opinions and the ideas of what it is. And as a purchaser of swords, mm -hmm. it's really good for you to have confidence in your maker to have a depth of knowledge that is probably greater than your own, unless you're a pretty rare <laughs> individual, because you don't want to bore people at parties. But, um, you know, that's that's one thing that, that we see and, and kind of find humorous sometimes, is people will call up and say, well, there's this new steel. And it's, it's you know, or, oh yeah, I want this kind of sword, but all these swords have this. And we n oftentimes will even know who they got the info from because of what they're saying and how they say it. Mm -hmm. And, a lot of times that isn't the case. 
Um, you know, well, there it's, are. It's partially the case and not the most important part. Oh, yeah. Of the case. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, but it's, you know, that's the difference between us. It, Nathan and I talk about this, you know, people talk about, ooh, influencers. We don't consider ourselves influencers at all. Um, you know. Number one, we're too old and fat. Yeah. <laughs> and we, we're not gonna twerk. But. <laughs> Can't. <laughs> yeah, we'd hurt ourselves. Um, we consider ourselves educators, first and foremost, you know, for years. And I've, and I've said this for a long, long time that a good percentage of my job, especially when it's customer face to face, is I'm there to help them find the piece that makes them happy. Mm -hmm. But it's about education of what they're getting and why they want to get it. And why do you want a sword and what type of sword do you want? Those are all things that you answer with education, not necessarily, um, you know, the, the uh, coolest thing at the moment oh, yeah. uh, kind of attitude. Because one, they're expensive if it's a well-made sword. Mm -hmm. And two, if you're in the market in that level of the market, you want to have a piece that you uh, meets your needs and meets the expectations you have of what oh, you yeah. really want. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Got the different kinds of steel stuff, which is totally fine. Some people yep. are super in to steel, although I think it's one of the big differences between knife makers and sword makers. Like, if I'm gonna have an everyday yeah. carry knife that I want to stay sharp forever, I'll care more in certain ways, but like, I was at an event and the TV blacksmith was like ragging on the steel that we used to me. I was like, this, this steel is five times better <laughs> than what they were using in the <laughs> here. The steel is great, right? Mm. It's great. And yeah, you can use the newest one if you want. That's cool. And go do that if that's your thing. <laughs> I had a, a guy I learned a lot from, who had a big beard. <laughs> Some of you, that may matter. Yeah. Uh, had forged most his life. <laughs> and when he was around me and there was a discussion going on about steel types and all this and some young buck of a smith was talking about how his stuff was going to be better because he was going to use a 0742-N thingamajiggy. Um, he, he just kind of shook his head real slow. Kid said, what? He goes, you know, steel's hard. People are soft. Yeah, <laughs> That's the key. <laughs> Amazing oh, sword. Yeah. <laughs> and to be clear, we use 6150 carbon steel, which yeah. is an excellent sword steel. Yeah. It's great work. We chose it for a reason. Yeah, and <laughs> it's, and, you know, there's there's all sorts of good steels. Mm -hmm. there's Sometimes all... they get new names every 10 years because yeah. the different company buys right. it. <laughs> That's right. Um, and there's all sorts of quality steels that will do just as good as just about any other steel. If you are a person who dials in on something when you buy something, you know, you gotta do all the research, you gotta have all the options available to you and get all the things lined up the way you want, that's fine. But when you approach a Smith who's very experienced and says, you know, I like to work in this steel and this steel, and you say, well, I'd like it in that steel, and they say, hmm, you know, respect their opinion because they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They've been making swords for however long that may be oh, sure. in that steel. And it may be that they're very familiar with the steel you want to use and they don't like it that much. Or it may be that they say, you know, hey, I've seen steels come, go, left, right, center. Oh, I've sure. seen people get all excited about this and about that. And, and it has to be something they can work appropriately to yeah. produce the end result. Yep. Yeah. And right. what kind of sword are you getting from who and how are they going to do it? All that stuff comes into it. Totally. So yeah. in case you hadn't guessed, this is our grumpy curmudgeon. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's a whiskey of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So to sum it up, we really like historical swords mm. and that's what we try to do 
right? We try to make our swords so that if it got sent back in time and someone picked it up, they wouldn't think twice, right? They'd be like, oh, nice sword. Not, what is this magic sword? <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's what motivates us. Yeah. That's what we love. And it's totally legit for there to be a whole bunch of other stuff. Some people are really moved by fantasy things. Some people really like the most cutting edge stuff. Every time I pick up an original, there's a little feeling of electricity. There's a, there's a, a it's got a certain quality to how it handles. And that's what we try and put into each of our pieces when especially we've been able to handle the original and work with it yeah. is we're, we're thinking about those things when we make it too. So mm -hmm. it's never just about this aspect, that aspect, this spec or that spec. It's about the totality being a piece that is exceptional yeah. and as we can make it, up, it. When you yeah. pick it up, you say it. Oh yeah, yeah. There's, I see. There's certain swords. Yeah, it's you know, and you know, over the years, I've loved many a sword, mm -hmm. but there's two or three out there that you know, if when they ever decide to come back around, you know, I'll I'll take them. I'll I'll do anything I can to get them because oh, there are certain made. pieces, yeah. well, pieces I've made and historical pieces. Oh, sure. You know, there's. Yeah. There's some I know kind of where they are, and there's others I don't know where they've gone to. But sure. um, you know, there's there's some yeah. exceptional things that have been made in the past that when yeah. you touch them, they kind of change you a little oh, bit. Oh, totally. Yeah. I don't believe in ghosts, but <laughs> these things have an essence yeah. that when you hold a real one, mm. you know. And it's yeah. I always describe it to people as you know. A really good maker will put a little bit of themselves in something, no matter who they are. Mm -hmm. Da Vinci, he had a lot to give. Mm -hmm. Maybe a semi-good swordsmith in 1450, he could he produced two or three exceptional pieces sure. by chance, and then others were not so. But if, when you can pick a piece up made by somebody like that, even today, you will find a piece and it'll speak to you in a way that you don't realize before you pick it up. Oh yeah, it's yep. like the Sahagoon rapier in the Ochai collection. Every time I pick that up, it blows, blows yeah. my mind. But yeah. that's a month for a different day. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, thanks for sticking with us. Yeah. Have some wild turkey and enjoy whatever you like. Hopefully it's what we like. If not, whatever. Now our Just wives don't have to listen to us great tonight at dinner. So exactly. thank you guys. Take care. <laughs> Cheers. 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 Cheers.